it was definitely right to end it when it did. I mean, to come back now would just be mad, wouldn't it? Everyone must agree that you couldn't carry it on for years and years. There was nowhere really left for us to take it. It's just not even a debate for me that that was the right thing. There's not even a, a, a part of me that thinks, I wonder if we could do another one. We just mustn't. We were nobodies and we hadn't written before, hadn't directed before, hadn't acted before. But the reason they sort of let us sort of get on with it was, I think, because it didn't cost much. <laughs> David Brent. One of the important things, one of the cast requirements, was that we weren't known, we weren't famous. There's no point in doing, you know, a mock documentary if Julia Swaller is playing the receptionist or something. Dawn Tinsley, receptionist. Well, through this rage, haven't you? Yeah. I'd say, uh, at one time or another, every bloke in the office is woken up at the crack of dawn. <laughs> what? The first time The Office went out, uh, it wasn't greatly, greatly watched or greatly uh, fated. After the focus group, they could have pulled it, cos we got the joint lowest score ever of any focus group, along with women's bowls. So it's pretty bad. It must have been worrying for the BBC. You're a twat, Gareth. You're a twat and a nubbin. I'm still not listening, so it's not offending me, sir. Right, OK, so you won't hear this. You had a cock, you had a cock, you had a cock. You had a cock. It was this show that was on BBC Two Monday night that, um, with no stars in it, um, that could easily have fallen by the wayside, and it didn't, and it really, um, it hit. Gradually, you become more known, and that's really weird, and everyone has their own experiences. I knew the show had sort of taken off when um, I was walking home one night and I was recognised by... I don't know what the PC word for them is. A tramp. A hobo. A homeless. And uh, he came, it's, it's a proper one, like a young one, right? And he went, ah, oh, oh, man, I, I don't know where the homeless watch it, through Dixon's window or something, right? But he went, oh, man, he said, I've just been to HMV, I've just nicked a load of your DVDs. I get recognised all the time. I just moved into a place which is very close to a sixth form college. And that's a night, that can be a nightmare lunchtime or home time, they, they'll go crazy if, if a pack of them see Gareth walking past, so I, I've learnt all the detours. It is sort of creepy being recognised. It is creepy having your picture taken when you walk along the street. Um, but I think, as long as you handle it well, there's nothing to worry about. I think some people caught it, and uh, some people that get in trouble, you know, with the tabloids or whatever, they do sort of caught it. You, you know, what you don't do is just go out every night and be seen coming out of Stringfellows or China White's pissed up or coked up, um, you know, with a with a slapper. Do you know what I mean? Just... You, all I thought do something with my Tuesday night. Because <laughs> <laughs> at the moment... <laughs> you know. You will never work in a place like this again. This is brilliant. Fact. Yeah? And you'll never have another boss like me, someone who's basically a chilled-out entertainer. I have so many favourite scenes, don't really know where to start. My favourite scenes from The Office. My favourite scenes, uh Free love on the free love freeway. The love is free and the freeway's long. I got some hot love on the hot love highway. And going home cos my baby's gone, she's gone. Free love on the free love freeway. Love my favourite episode is still uh, episode 4, series 1. I thought episode four of series one was really good. It's so boring, but everybody sort of says episode four with the whole um, training and the whole guitar thing. Ooh. My favourite scene from that episode is probably the scene where I come in and declare that my fantasy would be two lesbians, probably. Sisters. I'm just watching. It still makes me cringe and laugh. OK, um... Tim, do you have one? Yeah, I never thought I'd say this, but can I hear more from Gareth, please? I like the comic relief episode. Well, I thought that was funny. I'll tell you what I love. What? That crazy dance you do. <laughs> it has just been shown so many times. I, I'm almost... <laughs> please. Whoa! Please. Please. No, I'm... No, I'm well, don't mention it then, or I will... It is just... 
<laughs> Steve, well, don't mention it then. Just please never do it. I know. <laughs> I never want to cut. Everyone since then has said to me, what did you and Martin say to each other in that room? And it's so weird because suddenly when someone asked me, it felt private. That's really ridiculous. Why would it feel private? It really did. And I was just like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to keep that to myself. But that's really stupid. Why would I want to keep it to myself? It's acting. If you want the rainbow, you've got to put up with the rain. Do you know which philosopher said that? Dolly Parton. Yeah. And people say she's just a big pair of tits. We were going to end it after the second series, but we thought, you know, we could have a bit of a cliffhanger and make that complete and then come back and, and tie up the loose ends of the story. When we came to write the specials, we took a visit, do you remember that? We took a visit to Slough with yeah. uh, our friend, comedian Jimmy Carr. He drove us around Slough because he's from Slough. We're looking for a place where Brent, David Brent, would live, and so we think uh, uh, quite a nice new estate, not too expensive, but not too um, terrible. And where are we here, Jimmy? Because this uh, looks perfect. Sort of Fisher me. Price mansions, really. This it's is... nice. It's you know, it's kind of a mix of flats and, and houses, and they're all sort of new. But this, this is perfect. But I think um, David Brent lives here. We tried to get everyone together for uh, a read-through. We normally have a little read-through and everyone just reads the scripts and we'd make any changes. But uh, I think it was impossible this time. Everyone was doing films. Mackenzie was off making films. Uh, Lucy was in America, I think. Just couldn't get anyone together. I think, I, I think it was me, Ricky, and Howard Brown from the Halifax yeah. ads. I think they were yeah. the only three people and there. And I only made the last hour because I was opening a leisure centre in Newport Pagnon with Big Keith. Yeah. That's not his real name. It is now. Is it? Yeah. Changed it. <laughs> <laughs> two series, two Christmas specials, never paid attention. <laughs> I just say, you know, it's different on every other shoot. You know, if you make a film or anything like that, you can't muck around, it's all filming the camera. And, yeah, do I want? <laughs> Did you see him? Did you see him nod at me? <laughs> that one. <laughs> Rick, can you talk to him a second? When we got to the Christmas specials, you know, we, I thought it'd be different. Nah. <laughs> still winding up Martin, still trying to ruin scenes by just telling him stupid stuff. On the way to work, maybe Ricky had had a gr one of his great ideas, as I like to call them, uh, and thought, not only can I make the working day longer, but how can I make it less productive? Because he knows I will sometimes laugh <laughs> at what he does. He kind of created a, a whole new bit of business. I'm coming up, so you better get a party started. Shamal. <laughs> <laughs> he can't stop a scene. He can't stop a take. He has to go with it. And if he laughs, it's his fault. So it was not only Shamal, there was also uh, Tim, Tim, Timbo, Timber. And so, like, made this kind of sound of timbo. Hey. Timbo. Timbo. <laughs> <laughs> there was also Tim Canterbury, so we should be led forward to the Bishop of Canterbury. Tim Canterbury. Hello, mate. Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Bishop Muzarewa. <laughs> Bishop Muzarewa, he said, which is a name I have not heard since about 1980, and it really made me laugh. Bishop Muzarewa. Like that. <laughs> oh, it's all good stuff. It's all good work. <laughs> OK. So that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> OK. Is it, though? <laughs> there he is. Mr Canterbury. Archbishop of Canterbury. Bishop Mazariwa. Bashing the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly why he, he did that. It's because he wanted to see me, the more professional and experienced of the two actors, fumble. <laughs> and then there's pictures. There's always pictures drawn, lots of pictures of unspeakable things. Ricky likes to draw pictures and then present them to you. Uh, and nonchalantly, so that the camera can't see. Just below the camera level, he'll present something horrific. Not right, is it? <laughs> Not right. <laughs> I've got those pictures. They're safe. They're my Diana letters. <laughs> if 
from the start, I know that everybody had quite liked to think of a romantic ending. I think a lot of people initially thought that David Brent was the focus of the show, but really for us, I think it was always the Tim and Dawn love story and their sort of storyline was, uh, was kind of the heart of the, was the heart of the show. I've just heard you were leaving. Why Say it isn't so. It goes around fast. It is, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Were you going to tell me or...? God, yeah. Steve Merchant had rung me um, and said, oh, I think we've shot ourselves in the foot a bit um, by sending um, Dawn and Lee off to Florida because now we've got to get her back. The cost of living out of here is so cheap. You can live on a pittance. In fact, our situation here is almost as good as it was in Slough, isn't it? Definitely. It's just suddenly struck us that if a documentary crew is making a documentary, they can invite people back. What if we were able to arrange for you to go back? We've got a million reasons we can't go. So. What do you mean arranging? Well, if we were able to take care of everything, would you want to go back? Yeah, of course. Let's talk about it first. Is that a genuine offer? Documentaries do that all the time. People think they don't interfere, but of course they do. Yeah. You know, I was always worried about that's when it interfering that um, watching wildlife documentaries. When I was growing up, I was thinking, they'd go, and there's the lion. <gasps> He's seen the, the young antelope. Right? And I was thinking, if I was watching that, I'd go, run, there's a fucking lion! And they never did. And I hated it when the lion got there and ate this little creature in front of everybody. And I said to my mum, well, why didn't they stop it? And my mum said, well, you can't interfere with nature. And I thought, oh, I'd like to see the lion turn on David Attenborough. And what do they do then? The crew would go, sorry, Dave, I've got, he's eating the old bollocks. So it's OK to be ripped apart of your little impala, but if you're award-winning David Attenborough, they get the lion off you. One law for the Attenborough, one for the little impala. And then as soon as the bit came where Dawn was getting out of the car to come back to Wernham Hog to see everybody for the first time, I just had these tingles up my spine. No, Lee? Um, no, he's um, at his mum's. Hey. It was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And I, that's mad because actually reading something doesn't normally make me have have that reaction. And then I cried. Yeah, um, like in, in sort of Shakespeare or something. Like Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. I love him. Just like Shakespeare. What I Shakespeare love, are you thinking I of? Love right? I know you're a big fan. I, I do like Shakespeare. Yeah, you're so a big fan don't of be fooled by this image. I love all, all the Shakespeare stuff. Yeah. What sort well, of? And what do you? Well, like, like Romeo and Juliet. That is what I thought. Yeah. Tim and Dawn, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. In what way? Huh? Same. You, you've read Romeo and Juliet. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah I've seen it. it. I've seen it. And yeah. What happens in Romeo and Juliet? <laughs> Lots. <laughs> Lots of stuff. All the, they um, they uh, they meet and they um, they sort of fall in love. Mm-hmm. But because uh, it's olden days, they uh, all dressed uh, dressed differently. But and then they after they meet, it's about two hours of all Shakespeare stuff. Mm-hmm. I can't understand what they're saying because it's all gobbledygook, but it doesn't matter in that because love is um, blind and deaf, so it doesn't matter what you... Right. And then um, I think she plays hard to get for a little while. <laughs> She's on the balcony high up and he's going, why are you up there? <laughs> She's yeah. going, well, come up if you want some. And she lets her hair down and he climbs up and... <laughs> they're straight to it. Sure. <laughs> Gives sure. her one. I think some uh, a journalist wrote that the weather broke, and I really liked that phrase. That after, out of everything that happened, it was like, oh my god! Suddenly, without being completely over the top, Brent had some hope in his life. He told Finchie to fuck off, which is probably the best moment for me. That is probably the only scene where I got a little bit of an adrenaline rush just saying it, just saying, Chris, <laughs> yeah. why don't you fuck off? The important thing was a change in attitude, that's all. Nothing definitive, he just went to Finch, fuck off. You know, that was great, I really enjoyed doing that. Think about what Gareth could be doing now, and the fact is he'd be at Wernham Hog in much the same position as he always was, and I think, look at it again, in, you know, 10 years' time, he'd still be in pretty much the same position. I think that um, Dawn and Tim will just naturally have moved in together and that won't be a thing where it's like, let's spend 18 months together and decide about this. I think he would still be there, but maybe a bit happier. It'd be nice to go, yeah, no, she's got a man and, and now she's like a famous illustrator, but let's face it, it's Slough and it's the real world and I think that probably she still will be doing receptionist, but she'll be dead happy. Wrong.
Well, that's a bit ungracious. Well, they've got no idea. Why do, why do actors go, oh, I think they'd be doing this. I'll tell you what they'd be doing, whatever I fucking write. <laughs> Learn the lines. That's a bit ungracious, though. Everyone's well, allowed to think where they might be yeah, in the future. Yeah, don't try and worm your way in onto writing. You're actors. You're hired hands. It's hard to escape the uh, part of Dawn. I think you have to be a little bit careful with your choices. You're not going to play a receptionist for a while. The happiness about being involved in it, I think, outweighs the worry about escaping the shadow. If people are still shouting Tim at me when I'm 55, I will kind of understand it, but I will sort of as well wonder why I haven't done something else that <laughs> makes them not shout Tim at me. Do you know what I mean? There are, there are a lot worse things to be shouted at me, do you know what I mean? There are a lot worse. Uh, most of them were shouted at me during the filming of the show. There is a kind of fondness knowing that we were all part of the same gang, you know, in a job well done. I'd be hard pushed to find a job where you laughed as much every day, do you know what I mean? And where you were genuinely that happy to go to work. I, I can't see a, a situation where we'd all be back together as, as one team working together. And yeah, that's sad. That's, that's sort of the end of an era. And I'm just sorry that we won't work together again. It's pretty sad. Get over it. <laughs> Harsh. We're not going to work together again. Next. It's tough. Where are you going? Huh? Is that it then, is it? Yeah, got a sauna. 